when this happens, then I'll be happy. When I get to this sure. point, then I'll be happy. And that point yeah. is always in the future, and it's always now. If you're not happy now, you're not ever gonna be happy. Stop thinking that's gonna happen. It's not. You gotta be happy now. That's a good point. Make yourself happy yeah. now, no matter what, and you'll always be happy. Bingo! It's that easy. Although it's hard. <laughs> Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Low Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. All right, we have an amazing episode today as always. Uh, This was actually a very inspiring episode. This is not what I expected uh, after talking to this gentleman. His name, Dan Perraro, is a famous um, cartoonist, artist, designer, just creative person in general. Uh, He does this uh, comic called Bizarro. Uh, You can find it at bizarro.com, B-I-Z-A-R-R-O. We'll have all of this in the description as well. Um, And he's been doing a comic, literally one a day for like 30 years or something. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so we talk about that and we just get into other things just like any podcast. But to be honest with you, Dan was very inspiring. You know, he had a lot of nuggets of wisdom about life and, um, you know, just some things that really stuck with me after the podcast. I'm not going to lie. Um, so I think the same thing is going to happen to you. You know, that's the that's the great thing about life. You never know where you're going to find these little nuggets of wisdom, you know, about how to live life. So. Yeah. Uh, One in particular, I'll tell you real quick. Um, He said, the way you live your day is the way you live your life. So you think about that and what that means to you. meant a lot to me. Um, And just there's so much great stuff. He's living in Mexico. We talked about that. Um, Just a great guy. I super enjoyed our conversation. This is the type of guy with I want to go on a roof, smoke a joint with just, you know, chillax uh you know talk about anything and everything um just a great all-around guy and just can't wait to have him back on the podcast so there you go dan perar all right before we get to that uh here's a quick word uh from our sponsor and uh we'll be right back hi I wanted to talk to you about what's on the Texas Real Food site that's more than just putting in your zip code and finding, you know, the coolest butcher, farmer's market, restaurant around you. There's also other resources on the site, recipes, articles, and one in particular is called the Texas Mom Blog. It's awesome. Faria Khan is writing these beautiful articles. You can really learn a lot about Texas just giving you a lot of other things to think about food, family, everything behind that goes into food as well. So just different topics and uh, conversations, definitely something worth checking out as well. All right, back to the show. Okay. All right. Um, Let's get to this episode, but before I do, I got to tell you about social media, please check us out. Lone star plate TX and our YouTube channel, The Lone Star Plate Podcast. Please hit that subscribe button right now and the bell to be notified because we release new content every day, all week long, two new episodes a week. Well, I did two <laughs> two new episodes a week. Um, and then we break that down into clips. There's YouTube exclusives and starting this Thursday, I guess it'll already be out by the time this comes out, um, on Thursdays, um, at, on, at 7 or 7.30, I haven't decided yet, but somewhere around there, um, Central Time, I'm going to start doing a sort of a weekly wrap-up show, uh, you know, talking about the guests that we had that week, and then talking about the guests that are coming up next week, and just other stuff about the podcast, you have any questions, you want to know something, it, you know, this is the perfect opportunity, so we're going to start going live on on YouTube and and you know, make that a weekly thing and, and find a way to connect. Um, and then it'll be, you know, you can watch it after where you don't have to uh, watch it in the moment. So, and what I'm going to be doing is just bringing on some friends and different things to talk about stuff, that sort of thing. So I have someone to sort of play off of 
you know, to talk about it. But anyway, looking forward to that. So let's get back to the episode. Dan Peraro, Bizarro, amazing guy again. So enjoy. On the Lone Star Play podcast, we like to support other podcasts we like. So here's a quick word from a podcast called The Spark Parade. Art and entertainment inspire each of us in different ways. But have you ever wondered what inspires the people who create our cultural touchstones? On the Spark Parade podcast, your host Adam Muntz geeks out with artists and entertainers about their cultural spark of inspiration. Everything from Shakespeare to South Park. You'll hear from artists like Conor O'Burst on Northern Exposure, Roisin Murphy on Terrence Conran's The House Book, and Adrian Young on Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. The Spark Parade, where artists reveal their cultural inspirations to spark the inspiration in you. Find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, back to the show. I'll tell you what, let's start with what, what I know you the most for, which is this bizarro, you know, sort of world that, that has been created. So if you want to maybe explain to our viewers a little bit of that, and then we'll just sort of dive in. Yeah. So I've been doing... Um, uh, I've been doing a newspaper comic strip called Bizarro for 115 years. My math isn't very good. <laughs> 35 or it's a lot of years. Um, and um, I started in 85. So whatever that ends up being. And this is 2021. Um, and that was a cartoon a day. 365 days a year for 30 something years for 35 something, what, 36 years now. Um, so it's a, it's a, and, and that of course is the drawing a cartoon a day is not that hard for somebody who likes to draw, but coming up with an idea a day for 35 years is of course, that's the task. And the way you do that is by never looking ahead. You just think all I need is just one joke today. It's really a lesson in living in the present, because if you think about the future, your head will explode. There's no <laughs> way I'm going to be able to write a joke every day for 35 years. It just isn't going to happen. And I, I saw so every day I had to keep that idea out of my head. Um, and the truth is the, the kind of the fun thing about it is that um, like everything else, the more you practice it, the better you get at it. And so sure. I would just sit down because I had to, because I had a contract and, uh, and kids to raise and a mortgage. I just sat down every day and forced myself to let my mind wander until I came across something that amused me in some way that I thought I could draw. And year by year, it actually became easier instead of harder, which is the good news. Um, now, the last uh, few years, uh, I actually semi-retired. I, I, uh, three, I guess three years ago, um, I hired a, a good friend of mine and colleague who I think is a terrific cartoonist and, and, and who I've worked with over the years off and on. I hired him to do my Monday through Saturday cartoons, and I only do the Sunday ones now. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the Sunday ones are the, are the bigger ones with more art. And so, you know, I, I try to make them visually more interesting and exciting uh, than the daily ones can be. You know, the weekday cartoons can't be that that elaborately drawn because they published this big in the average newspaper. Yeah. I mean, these days most people see my work online and online it looks great. Um, and that's, but, but in the newspaper, quite honestly, it, it often looks kind of not very great because, <laughs> uh, you know, they shrink it down too small and they all use color. Now they all use color every day. It used to, when I started this back in the late 1900s, when I started this career, yeah. <laughs> um, they did, you know, weekday cartoons were not in color. It was only the sure. Sunday cartoon that was in color. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's right. That's right. I remember yeah. that. Now every day is in color. And most newspapers every day is in color. But most newspapers also don't have terrifically good printing presses. Um, newspapers are experiencing some um, financial difficulties these days since yeah. people get all of their information online. Yeah. It did so, you know, sure. you know, they don't, they can't afford to update their, they don't have state of the art printing anymore if they ever did. And, um, and that, and so sometimes my colors look kind of dark and murky in the newspapers. Um, but what are you going to do? Um, sorry, folks. <laughs> I, I, now, I now have to make them look good for, for the internet because, you know, that's where everybody sees this stuff. Of course, the other problem with that, now this is an inherent problem. I'm, I'm doing all the talking, Patrick. If you have anything to say, just jump in. 
Trust me, nobody wants to hear me. You talk, I promise. This is what we want here. <laughs> well, one of the other problems in my industry, in newspaper industry, is that when I got started, I, I did this in the in the in the nineteen eighties. I was in my uh, I was in my twenties, and I was trying to find something to do for a living uh, that wasn't too painful. And um, and I was an artist since I was a kid. Like I was always just an artist, an artist, an artist. That was what I wanted to do. Well, as soon as I didn't, as soon as I no longer wanted to be a cowboy or an astronaut, I realized I wanted to be an artist. And yeah, you know, those those occupations left me. The desire for those occupations left me around the age of six or seven, I suppose. But wow. um, that's pretty early for, the, for most kids. They're hanging on to that for a few yeah. more years, at least. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe maybe more like sixteen or seventeen. I stopped. yeah, <laughs> that sounds more realistic. Cowboy or uh, astronaut. So let's be honest. Yeah, by the time I finally realized that, I couldn't. I couldn't have a career. No. So I um. So I became an. Uh, so I was looking for a way to be an artist, and I ended up getting into advertising. And advertising is is a, a, is a, it's a it's a kind of soul death that I don't wish on anybody. No, that's not true. Actually, I have a lot of friends in advertising and advertising can be very creative and cool. But the problem is you're working most of the time you're working for a corporation that, that some, somebody at the top of some company or corporation who isn't necessarily an artist or a creative visionary, and they just want it to be um, boring and sell more potato chips or whatever. So advertising art is a, is still a very rough game. It's a better job than a lot of things, but for a guy like me, but it wasn't what I really wanted to do. So right. anyway, I happened to get into cartooning. Eventually I started making a little bit of, of a living at it. Um, but, and, and, and in those days you could make a living at newspaper cartoons because every city had one or more newspapers. Absolutely. It was, a, it was the thing, right. To get, right. Yeah, absolutely. That was how people read cartoons was in the newspaper. There was no yeah. internet. That's what I did. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Every Sunday that my thing was only on Sundays. Yeah, yeah, the Sunday yeah. comics. Right. Yeah, Sunday comics. Yeah, yeah, everybody remembers that. We fought over it in my house. Everybody would fight over it. Yeah. It was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. You get to get them first. <laughs> but uh, and nowadays, you know, the um uh you you it's just really hard to make a living through the newspapers anymore because newspapers are, are cutting their, you know, they're having some trouble financially. Sure. Is the internet and the on, on the internet, you don't make any money from the internet because everything is free on the internet. Right, you know, right. We've been, yeah. we've been giving away comic newspapers have been giving away comics on the on the internet now for twenty years. So it's, we can't all of a sudden stand up and say, "Hey, no more!" You know, we're going to charge everybody for our comics. So it's it's become a difficult problem for a lot of cartoonists. Like they're you know the bottom of their of their previous financial um, uh, profile drops out, and you've got to sure. figure out a new way. So people start selling products and things online, and you know what? I haven't, I've done a little bit of that, but quite honestly, I've not made money off of products. What do you mean products? Like, so, what do you mean well, by like, that? You know, if I had, if I had a, if I had a character like Garfield or Mutz, it's got a little, a cute dog and a cute cat. If you've got characters, if you get cute characters, people will buy anything and they become popular. People will buy anything you print those on. I got you. Okay. Bizarro doesn't have that. Bizarro is just weird jokes every day. It's just a different joke every day and there's no characters. So there's nothing to, and people buy weird jokes occasionally on a shirt, on a card. You know, I, I, I sell some cards and things, but for the most part, I don't have like some giant marketing kingdom that I can just like print Bizarro on underwear and socks and, you know, juice boxes and whatever. Yeah. I can't really do that. With my but you know what's really amazing and inspiring is this gift economy idea. Um, I just started because I post a blog. I do a I do a blog post every week, and I and I and I talk to my fans pretty regularly in 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 social media. My email is available for people and stuff, and so I'm in contact with my fans. And I just tell them, look, if you're you know like I don't have ads on my site. I don't have ads. I don't have pop ups. I don't have I don't have a sign in. I don't have any of that bullshit. I don't like any of that stuff. It drives me nuts when I have when I go online and I have to dodge these ads constantly. So I don't do that. And I just tell people, if you appreciate, if you if you're enjoying my jokes and you're and you appreciate that I'm not inundating you with ads, consider dropping a buck in the tip jar now and then. And no, it isn't a living, but I'm surprised by how many people will donate. Some will donate monthly. Um, yeah. You know, there's people on Patreon, artists on Patreon all, of all types. Yeah, and musicians and poets and all kinds of stuff on Patreon, and people just sign up to send them money every month because they enjoy what they do. And it's a really 
beautiful thing. It, it, in turn, personally, I think it beats the hell out of capitalism. You know, this idea of just like, here's a, here's a thing that means something to me. I want to share it with you. If it means something to you, you can have it for free. Yeah. If it means something to you, maybe toss, toss me a buck or two back. And people will. It's a really lovely thing. And, I, and I've, yeah. been, I've been uh, just sort of touched and encouraged by that. It kind of gives you uh, a little more faith in, in uh, human, human nature, I think. No, I agree. Um, I, you know, it's definitely super popular with musicians. Podcasts do it. Uh, we'll eventually go to that model ourselves. We've talked about it a lot. Uh, we have a big sponsor, so we're not in the same position as other podcasts. Um, right. But yeah, absolutely. I'm all about it. It's creative freedom. You've got all these individual. You can put your money where you want it to go to support that artist and literally just go straight to them. You know, so yeah, yeah I'm, I'm all about we've you know, we, I've actually had several like, you know, conversations with other podcasters because that's the mediums changing as well. Apple is starting to offer subscriptions to your podcast through Apple Podcasts. Spotify is going to start doing the same thing. So you're going to start to see that change of, you know, how, how they make the money. We, we don't need to go uh, whatever over here and sell our soul and right. Sell these different products. We want yeah. nothing to do with yeah. and do all these different sponsorships. We can just get it straight from our fans, provide the content they want, right? Create this nice two way street and, yeah, I'm all about it. I'm with yeah. you. This is one reason I love YouTube so much. Right, right. Well, I mean, that. yeah, I mean, that's the thing about the internet. Is that so much is for free on the internet that, you know, people are reluctant to pay for something they can get for free. Sure. And so, of course, it just sort of led to this. Like, people just started saying, hey, um, I can't. Well, for instance, musicians. Musicians used to be able to sell CDs and albums. They used oh, yeah, to be those, able to sell that's their done. Music. Those days and now done. they have to tour. Yeah, you have to be on the road, living out of a bus and and a million motels and always out in the middle of the night playing. You know, it's I used yeah. to be in a band and that was the thing that drove me away from it was the schedule of it. Like it's just, sure. I'm just not an all night person. I'm more yeah. of a morning creative type. So, um, yeah, and now they and now that, that that's what that's what they they have to tour constantly. And it's it's the internet has done some amazing things for a lot of people. It but you know, in the, the bottom line is it has never been easier to get your creative efforts in front of people because yeah. of the internet. And yeah. it's never been harder to get paid for it. Absolutely. That's a great point. You're making buy, a great point. I put my cartoons in books. People don't buy cartoon books very much anymore because it's yeah. all on the internet for free. So sure. You know, it's, but, but, but right. that's, it's just the reality. So you have to find yeah. a way, you have to find a way to deal with that. You know, I things can, got shaken up. Right. And then it's, we're seeing some good and bad come out of it. And it's everybody's just trying to figure out how to pivot and change and adapt to this, this yeah. new way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the people are deciding, right. We're consumers too. We essentially ha are helping the decisions. You know, we, we, you, you probably buy off Amazon like I do. You probably watch Netflix. You probably watch YouTube video, right? It's like we all do that. We're all part of it. It's it's kind of this crazy, crazy thing for sure. It's it's nuts. Yeah, it's I can't changing. imagine. Yeah, yeah. I can't it's imagine being in your position. Yeah. Sure. How, how old are you? You're like you're like much younger than I am. How how old do you think I am? I'm curious. I want to say um, 12, 13. <laughs> <laughs> You seem very youthful to me. I have the mind of a 12 or 13 year old. That's for sure. I'm 41. I'm 41. No, you don't look 41. Yeah, but I know. Anyway. I know. Uh, let's I see. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do the math again. So, so basically you're, you're 20 years younger than I am. Okay. Um, and so let's see. So, so you were, so you were born in like 68, 67, 68, something like that. Right? No, no, no. 79. 70. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's 10. <laughs> 20 would be 79. Not 69, <laughs> 79. All right. So, so the internet is kind of a permanent thing in your memory of your life. Like you don't read, you didn't have to be an adult before the internet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was out, but I didn't really use it. Yeah. You know, when I graduated in 98, it's not like everybody was on the internet all day. Like yeah. not at all. Yeah, you're kind of, um, yeah, that's right. You're kind of in the middle there where you sort of start, started your adult life as the internet started picking up. Correct. Steam. Exactly. It, yeah, right when I was like 20 or so, 21, yeah. you know, it started to take off. And then, you know, yeah, MySpace was like my first real experience yeah. with social, you know, but I was in my mid 20s at that point. Yeah. Uh, I definitely it's, didn't grow up with the Internet or social yeah. media or phones or any of that stuff. I didn't grow up with any of that. 
Yeah, but you were still young enough to where you could see. I, Adapt you know, to it, for sure, 100%. Yeah. The 100%. whole world changed. Like between the, between the time I was 35 and 40, the way everything worked completely changed. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah. A, it's, it's a very, it was a, and millions of people all over the world have experienced this. I mean, technology has changed things so quickly and it, and it moves yeah. exponentially faster. So there's a good chance that even though you're 40 ish now, that by the time you're 50 ish, it will change again. I believe and, that. And you'll suddenly be like, nothing works the way it was supposed to. You know, if you have kids, you'll be calling your kids and saying, how do I do this? And I'll go, oh, dad, it's like, do, 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 like this. They'll go, you'll go like, how do I sign up for this website? And they'll go, dad, just think about a dog then put your name in the space that appears in front of your eyes. And you'll go, that doesn't make sense to me. We used to have phones and computers to do this with, and now you do it inside your eyelids, and I'm having a lot of trouble. <laughs> like, that's the way I feel about what the internet did to the world I grew up in, and sure. even and even it succeeded in for 20 years until it all hit, and then bam, everything's different. Well, technology changing. What I'm more curious about is, I, I mean, that I, I definitely want to dig deeper into that because you're right. It's 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 kind of been skipping like a rock skipping late, lately. I've I mean, even from when I was 22 now at 41, it's it's nine and day. It's a complete night and day experience. Um, I have to ask my nephews how to use shit on my iPad and iPhones. I, I don't know everything. I really don't. And they're they're six and seven and they know better than me. That's that's what's that. That's who I see is growing up in this different era seeing my wow. nephews grow up they're just like this whole right. different environment yeah. uh and i think about where they're going to be at at my age like mm -hmm. holy shit the world will be you know just completely different um i'm curious when the when the change happened for um when, when it went digital for you for the comics um did everyone or were all artists so were there like different camps within the artistry, right? Like, no, nah, I'm all about this. And other people, you know, just like film is right. You got these directors that let's stick with film. Others wanting to push digital, right? It's, it's, we're at that stage where, so I'm curious if there was different camps in, in the artist, you know, world. Yeah. Yeah, there definitely are. Um, of course, the younger artists had less trouble adapting than older artists did. I was, I was kind of in the middle there somewhere. Um, I started putting my email, in fact, like before I had a website, before cartoonists had a website, I guess it was Scott Adams who was sort of the most advanced at the time. And he started putting his email in his cartoon. And, oh, and wow. at the time I'm thinking, holy crap. And this was in the 90s, like the mid 90s he was doing this. Oh, and wow. I, like, I, I didn't even have email. Me neither. <laughs> like yeah, absolutely. Time, of course. When he started doing that, I didn't even have email. But, you know, his his cartoon is just, just where he lived. You know, he was an engineer tech guy. That was what his cartoon was all about. And so, of course, he was going to do that. Yeah. Um, but I thought, well, and, and of course, Dilbert is is uh, hugely more popular than Bizarro. Bizarro, it's, it's, it's meant for office workers. And Bizarro is meant for people who have taken a lot of drugs and like to think around corners. So there's not <laughs> really as many. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. But. There's not really, you know, there's just naturally not as many bizarro fans as it's going to be for Dilbert or Garfield or any of these things that relate to most people in most situations. You know. Sure, sure. Uh, so, so it was easier for me. So I, I actually tried, I actually did that fairly early on. And then I got a, you know, and I got a website and I, I was like trying to play that game. I mean, I have been yeah. playing that game yeah. um, all along, but I've never been, but then when it came to social media, like that's just something I'm not That's a so, different animal, right? It's That's a, totally a different, yeah. Yeah, it, it it can eat your world really fast. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I'm a, and 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 I just I've got a lot to do. Like I've always got I have always got creative projects going. A, a few of them at the same time. Like I've got, I've got my, like there's a painting behind me. I I will I will have a painting going. I will have a a book project with a friend going. Um, at the moment I have a graphic novel that I'm illustrating and then I've got my regular deadline for my cartoon day in and day out, day in and day out, the cartoon, the cartoon, the cartoon, always the fucking cartoon. So <laughs> I don't have time to be tweeting, you know, yeah. I just don't have time. I don't have time to be, I don't, I don't have time to be reading tweets. I don't have time to be looking at people's Facebook. I just, I know very little about social media. I know it exists. And once a week I go, hey, I posted a blog, I did a blog post. I, hey, I said something about this, I said thing. But 
just to just, but I'm more of a producer of content than I am a consumer of content. Sure. So I understand what you're saying. I understand. I, I'm creating stuff all the time and putting it out there online, but I, I just don't have time to be spending time online surfing and doing stuff. Consequently, I don't really keep up with how these things work very well. And they're changing so fast. I'm like, oh, Facebook isn't the thing anymore. Where am I supposed to be now? Oh, Instagram. Yeah, that's exactly. not the thing anymore. Where am I supposed to be now? Oh, TikTok. Oh, that's oh. been outlawed because uh, China made fun of Trump. Oh, where do I go now? Like, <laughs> I don't even know what's going on anymore. <laughs> you know, so this is why now I depend on my I depend on my adult daughters who are very hip and cool and smart and creative and in their thirties and they know how this shit works. So yeah. I just you know I say, would you would you please I will pay you if you will post stuff <laughs> for me, and just so that I can I just want to be you know honestly I want to be left alone in my art studio. I don't, sure. don't want to have to be connected to the world by the internet day in and day out. It, it's just not my. It's not my desire. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. I, I definitely get it for sure. You kind of feel locked in to have the accounts, right? Because of your artistry, right? You feel like you have to yeah. have it, right? Yeah, yeah. I get it. I and get it. I feel the same way. I'll be honest with you. I hate Facebook so much that if I didn't, if I didn't feel like that was my main connection to my readership, I wouldn't have a Facebook page. Facebook. Oh, me neither. I agree. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. I wouldn't have any page. I just, it's, it's not my favorite thing to do. I like putting my stuff out there for people to see. I like sharing my stuff, but sure. But like the kind of hoops you have to jump. I mean, Facebook stole a whole, I mean, somebody probably an inside job. I don't know. Somebody stole a thousand dollars from me through my Facebook account somehow. And I can't get that money back. And it's all dead ends and dead links. And I'm like, you know what, you know how much time I'm going to waste on this? No more. Like a thousand dollars, fine, keep it. I don't give a shit. I'm not gonna spend the rest of my life chasing Mark Zuckerberg for a thousand bucks. You know, oh, that's horrible. Just, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. That's horrible. Yeah, but that, but who cares? You know, it's like that. So I shut that part of my Facebook down and I took that thing off and I told PayPal, don't accept any more emails from Facebook, you know, whatever. I did, I went into the back doors and I changed everything and switched to something and changed my passwords. And that's not going to work. Somebody eventually is going to hack me again and steal a bunch of money. And all you can do about that is just realize it's the price of living in this world in the 21st century. <laughs> I guess that's what. Yeah. I mean, it's only going to get more expansive, right? It's only going to get more, yeah. you know, the norm, right? Oh, you, know what, you know what I heard about? I, I mean, yeah, well, you know what I heard about is that like people send me these emails sometimes and I know they're phony. It's like, I, I, I'm good at spotting scams, but I don't understand what the scam is, you know, <laughs> like how this person's asked me to do this. How does, I know it's a scam because I can tell by the way it's written, but how is it going to work? And somebody told me recently, oh, here's how it works. And they gave me this whole scenario. They said, they tell you they're going to send you a bunch of money and they trick you into screen sharing with them. And then they put, and then they say, I'm going to send you $250. And you say, okay. And then they, and they, and they get your bank account and they, and they share the screen with you. And then it's actually a fake screen. It says they sent you $25,000. And then they go, oh my God, I can't believe that I did that. Oh my God, I'm going to lose my job. I'm gonna, my kids are going to, I'm going to be out in the street. Oh my God. Can you just keep the two, keep 250, but send me back the other. And you think you're looking at your bank's screen, but you're not. You're looking at one that they faked and you send them. And I'm like, wow. I, I can imagine how certain people fall for that. You know, you really think that you, that this person was trying to do something nice and messed up. And now you have to do something nice back to make it okay. And you do. Yeah. And you're screwed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that wouldn't happen to me because one thing I would never share a screen with a stranger and go to my bank account. But I understand sure. some people do, and it's like it's just super sad. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you know, I worry about my mother. Uh, you know, my mom sometimes listens. Listen, mom, I'm sorry, but you know, I worry about my mother falling for these things. Like it's no because it has happened before. You know, it's yes, man. Look, I get it. Yeah, you're right. I I've, I think I've seen a YouTube video about that happening where they yeah they use the screen they they fake this website you think you're looking at yours yeah. and it's not at all and yeah you think it's all happening you send the money and then you can't of course you can never get a hold of them again right the money's gone right yeah it's, yeah. It's, it's, they're, it's they're in, yeah they're in you know india or uh, yeah. russia somewhere i mean they had, yeah. you know <laughs> you yeah. have no idea yeah. where that person is oh well you're right that's a great point it's a new way to you know 
Yeah, you just you, new security, new way for people to come into your lives, uh, you know, and just a lot of people just aren't prepared for it, yeah. you know, they're just yeah. not prepared for it. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, you're I'm absolutely also, right. I'm also a person who just really prefers to live in the real world rather than the screen world. And and that's not to say that, like, I do stuff online every day. I sure, watch, of course. I will watch an hour or two of television every night, almost every night. But most of the time, I like to be in the real world. I'm not like, like, because I've seen so many people under a certain age that they're in their screen. 80% of the time that they're awake, they're in their sure. screen. Sure. And of course, you know, it's, it's so, um, uh, what is that word? Okay, boomer or whatever. It's so, it's like so typical of my generation to object to the internet. I know, but nobody knows <laughs> what happens to a, a human mind that spends most of its time there instead of here. Uh, it's not good for my mind. I know that much and I'm not going to do it. So anyway, whatever. I don't want to, I don't want to preach to children about getting offline. That's, that's your, that's your problem. It balances itself out. I think, uh, hopefully, right. You hopefully that's what people do. Uh, you know, for sure. It, it's definitely a problem. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, I think the screen thing, you know, you were talking about earlier about technology. It changes so exponential, right? The growth of it, um, yeah. that 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 medium will probably be gone before too long, right? They're talking about um, augmented reality, uh, like you said, the implants, right? So the back of your eyelid, um, Neuralink. I just saw that Neuralink video of a monkey playing Pong with his mind. Oh, I haven't seen that, and it sounds yeah. like I want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little scary it's a little like planet of the apes right you're just like okay this is what we're one one code line away from you know completely being taken over here or it, it's just a different you know we don't know what's going to happen right the unknown it, it is a little crazy artificial little intelligence crazy. could be as different i was just reading this not long ago artificial intelligence could be could make the world as different to us as our current world would be to somebody from 500 years ago Oh, wow. Who's what? I mean, like your head could literally explode. Sure. Right, you know, when that this kind of stuff starts happening. So who knows? It's there's no point in worrying about the future. I like to be here now. Be here in the now. moment. Here in the moment. Yeah, yeah. Like your jokes, right? You were saying every day you get up, you go through, and you come up with the idea. You don't worry about anything after or anything before, maybe. It, well, that's yeah. a good question. Do you, do you worry about any past things you've done as? You, or you not try not to do that either? Not unless there's something I can do to fix it. No. Um, I mean, it, it, no, I don't. I, I, um, and, and that's a trick. It's not an easy thing to do, but I'm a big believer in, I'm, uh, I'm a big believer in, it is never any time but now, and it never will be. Sure. It has never been any time but now. And if you live in the past or li you live in the future, you can do nothing about those things. Okay, here's a perfect example. I love this. Let's say, and, and this, is, this, is, this is how PTSD works. This is how PTSD fucks people over. And by the way, the major PTSD is, is uh, very well known for people who've been in combat. Yeah. But there are far, far, far more victims of PTSD who have simply been abused physically sure. or, or emotionally, especially yeah. in childhood. Yeah. And so there are a lot of PTSD sufferers walking around who, who were never in the military. I just want to say that. But here's what happens. Let's say that you're um, you're walking, you know, whatever. You're walking home. You get attacked by a couple of thugs and they beat you up. You know, not horrible. They beat you up. They take your stuff. You you have to walk home. You have to you go to a hospital, whatever. You're okay. But it haunts you. It haunts you. It haunts you for the rest of your life, right? So here's how I, th I think a, a part of how that works is that we do this to ourselves all the time. This is, it's, it's a large version of a small thing that we all do to ourselves. One day I was sitting here, this was like two weeks ago. I was sitting here trying to get some work done in my office, but there were some workers in the house finishing up this, this little renovation project we had going. And they were walking through the room. They were asking me questions. They were making noise and it was driving me crazy all day long. And so I couldn't <laughs> wait. I was like, I just want, can I just have, a half hour of peace and quiet to get something done. Okay. So let's jump to six o'clock at night where I go, I go up to, I have a rooftop patio. I live in Mexico and I have a rooftop patio 
and I can see the whole town from here and it's beautiful and the sun goes down and the whole town turns golden and I have all my plants and my, my comfortable little chairs and I'm smoking a joint and I'm having a cocktail and I'm watching the sun go down and I'm thinking about how pissed off I was all day that those workers were here. Finally, I have the thing I was asking for, 30 minutes of peace. And what do I do? I spend it reliving the aggravation of the day. And this is what happens in PTSD is you can't wow. stop reliving the terrible day. So you didn't get mugged once. You get mugged every day for as many years as you play this game in your head, as you sure. allow it to happen. And I'm not saying it's easy to get rid of. It, it takes some effort. But yeah. that's the thing that we do to ourselves all the time. This is the point of being present. Right now, in this moment, I am not being attacked. I'm not being insulted. I'm not starving. I'm happy. I'm just sitting here comfortably talking to you, yeah. having a conversation. Why shouldn't I enjoy this moment to its fullest, regardless of what happened before and regardless of what might happen an hour later or next week or next month or next year? So that's the beauty of being in the moment is that you're only here doing this now. That's, that's, that's one of the beauties of be here now, I think, um, that I like to, that I just employ. I haven't always been good at this. <laughs> of course. Of I course. spent 20 years being irritable and anxious and on antidepressants. Well, actually I spent 15 years being irritable and anxious. And then I spent, and then I got on antidepressants, spent another 20 years, um, just trying to pretend everything was okay because I felt okay-ish, but I really had not yet learned to really be present and appreciate this moment for whatever it is and not let my ego get all bent out of shape and not let my fear get to me so that I'm anxious as hell about what am I going to do for this and that and the other. Um, there's, there's just, a, and it takes time. This is the beauty of old days. In fact, I'll tell you a secret, which you'll, which you'll, which we all will be discovering very soon. Getting everything out of it, getting older is better, except your body, what it does to your body. That's the only thing. It's the only sure. bad part of old age is that your body starts to betray you. It doesn't sure. work like you expected it to. Yeah. Yeah. It isn't what it used to do. You know, it hurts longer than it used to after you <laughs> fall out of a chair. You fall out of more chairs than you used to. Yeah. <laughs> it's just your body doesn't work the way it used to, but everything else is great. It's like the wisdom that you get, the accumulated knowledge, the accumulated sense of what's important. At, you know, you you start to drop the bullshit. It's it's a it's a it's a really beautiful thing. And, I agree, and it should be cherished instead of yeah. dreaded. Sure, it should be cherished instead of dreaded. Yeah, I agree with all that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. just start to get, you just start to focus a little bit more and you know, put, put out the noise. The noise doesn't matter so much. Yeah. Right? And, it, and it happens, you know, it happens throughout your life. I mean, you're 40 something yeah. now and you're, and you're a much, you're a much wiser person than you were at 20 of course. than you were 20 years ago. Of course. Um, and, and of course that, that, that just continues to happen as long as you, but, but I'm, I mean, part of it is you've got to keep your, your brain alive. You've got to keep your heart open. Um, there's a lot to, there's a lot to improving your life. Um, it, it doesn't happen if it doesn't happen if you sit around and worry and complain. You're not gonna you're not gonna improve your life. You're gonna be ah oh here's here's one of my favorite sayings. I have a lot of favorite sayings. <laughs> here's one of them. <laughs> um, the way you spend your day is the way you spend your life. And it's wow. the truth. It's that the is truth. the truth. That it's is absolutely the truth. every day is a microcosm of what you're gonna the way you're going to spend your life. So 100%. make your day worthwhile. Do like you're doing something you like right now. You're enjoying this podcast. You do those things. If you were behind a counter at Wendy's, I could tell you, do you want to spend your life behind the counter at Wendy's? And that's not to say you need a better job. It's just is behind the counter at Wendy's feeding your soul. Exactly. Maybe it is. Yeah. I mean, it could yeah. totally, it could totally. Somebody Wait a second. Like, Which side of the counter am I on? <laughs> you're behind am, it am i, am I buying of, it oh okay okay yeah on both, right. on both yeah. sides you got some problems in the long run but i mean of course i do not uh listen <laughs> we're t the lone star plate i'm a chef i'm all about the good food so the, yeah that was a okay. joke for sure oh there you go so but like <laughs> you know i mean that's the other thing is that you could turn 
a job behind the counter at Wendy's into something that is meaningful to you. you there can, are happy people like that, right? No, I get, I totally get what you're saying. I got it. You could be a greeter at Walmart, whatever. You could be a sure. person who connects, who connects in a loving way with every person you meet. And, and behind the counter at a fast food restaurant, you're going to meet 70, 725 people a day. And, and you're going to spread that love and, you know, that energy, that good energy all day long. Yeah. And that can be a great, that can be a great life. But if you're in there yeah. just slinging burgers and can't wait to get home and play video games, that's not feeding your soul, man. That's not a place you should be. Sure. So and that's is, most people's life, right? Essentially, let's be real. Yeah. If you're constantly thinking about somewhere else that you'd yeah. rather be, yeah. not in the right place. Sure. And you're also not, and you're also not treating the place you are in the best that's, way you could. That's a great point too. That, yeah. That's a, that's actually a great point too. I've, I've always said that in jobs I've had, or, you know, I've always been in the restaurant industry for the most part. So yeah, I mean, for 15, almost 20 years now, um, that that's the thing. It's like, um, if I have to be here, right, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to care. That's the attitude I took. Um, I always did. There you go. And, and it always helped. It always got me to do. It got me to the point where I was able to do what I love. So, okay. you know, you kind of got to do those things. It's it's yeah, because, again, like you said, I really like that saying. I'm going to I'm going to steal that. Uh, you know, what what was it? The one day is your life. If whatever, you know, the day you're living is is your life or sort of. Yeah, you, I love that. the way you spend your day. The way you spend your day is the way you spend your life. The, the way you spend your days, the way you spend your life. Okay, that'll stick with me now. Yeah, that's a perfect, that's it. Like, that is exactly uh -huh. it. And that's the same thing at job. When you go, if you have a job or you go to work, how you show up for that, day, that's it. That's essentially what your whole life is going to be. So you're right. Um, that, That's very interesting uh, because especially in the restaurant industry, that is a huge problem. Everyone is all talking about what they're going to do when they get off work, right? That That's, yeah. that's literally the whole conversation. Yeah. You know, so that's interesting. And that can be a conversation, but if you're spending your whole day talking about where you'd rather be, like you, you have yeah. to be there. Obviously, you yeah. decided you have to be there. Sure. Where are you going to play? So, perfect example. Uh, recently, I stood in line for my vaccine. Okay. Um, Got it. Down here in Mexico, they, they in my town, they did the vaccine kind of like voting. They say, like, anybody who's 60 years old or older can go to these 15 locations around the city on these three days and get a vaccine. But you have to stand in line. You can't make an appointment. You have to stand in line. So sure. it's like voting. You get there when nobody's there and you're lucky and you go right through, but you might have to wait. Yeah. So yeah. I here I am. I've decided I don't want to go stand in line at a local high school <laughs> with a mask on, <laughs> you know, for who knows how many minutes or hours waiting to get this vaccine. I don't want to do it, but I decide I have to do this. Like, this is the place I'm going to be today for however long it takes. All right. So you're in line. You can do it two ways. You can, you can, you can. And, and there was a the reason I say this is that there was a person, two people ahead of me in line who did it this way, complained <laughs> about every single aspect of it. Yeah. They weren't doing it right. They could do it faster. What, which line am I supposed to be in? How many times I gonna, am I going to be asked to move chairs? How many cha Why aren't there enough chairs here? Why are people standing in the sun? Shouldn't we move into the shade? Like just constantly bitching and moaning out loud in Spanish. And some of the, and this was actually, an, this was an American who had, who is, who spoke really good Spanish. So, and, and so the people around her were Mexicans. Yeah. And they could understand her. Mexicans are really great at waiting in line because they're sure. not, they're not spoiled like Americans. They have to wait in line for a lot of shit in Mexico. You know, like <laughs> most, most, of, most of my neighbors here don't pay their bills online. They go stand in line at the electric company, like the old days and pay their bills. Absolutely. In yeah. Yeah. Because they still don't have the computers or they don't have a checking account or they don't have a credit card that they can do this stuff online. So they go do it in person with cash, right? They're yeah. used to this and they know how to do it politely and serenely because it's a, just a part of life to them. But Americans are all like, what about us? Right. And I mean, in my head, I was doing this, but I, but I decided not to do it outwardly. Right. <laughs> so this lady was like bitching and moaning in Spanish about how nothing was right. And people were like going, tranquilo, tranquilo. So we calm down. You know, it's not polite to be. And another thing I like about Mexico is that it's not polite to be angry in public. You don't hear people arguing and shouting in public or expressing their anger. 
They do it quietly and politely. They might be doing it at home. I'm sure they are. But in public, you don't do that in Mexico so much. So that lady was doing that. And two steps behind her, I was thinking, okay, I got to be here today. What can I learn from this? What's interesting? What might catch my eye? Well, I just, like, here's where I am right now for however many minutes or hours. What can I get from this? Not what's wrong with it. Yeah. What can I get from it? It's a whole different thing. It's like each day asking yourself, what, what's missing from my life or being grateful for what you have. Sure. Gratitude is such an amazing drug, such a yeah. powerful drug. Just be grateful for the, for the 10 things you have. Be grateful for three things you have instead of complaining about the 30 things you don't have. Guess what? You're always going to not have something. It's always going to be something you don't have. You know, it's like, it's just, it's just that. Those are the kind of, those are the kinds of attitudes that enable me to kick antidepressants. <laughs> yeah, totally get it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's such and a great way I to look realized, at it. Like I loved being on antidepressants, but you know what happened to me on anti antidepressants is that I didn't cry as often for good or bad reasons. I didn't cry from a sad movie. I didn't cry from a happy moment. Like I sure. would just be happy. I would be sad, but it was all. You were neutral. Yeah. You were just neutral. neutral. Kind of a neutral management. And when I kicked them, I started crying a lot and I love it. I can just yeah. be talking about my dad and start getting tears in my eyes because I love him. And that sure. didn't happen to me on antidepressants. You know, it's like, I love feeling these feelings and I don't let the terrible feelings crash my day anymore. Like they used to. And I sure. needed antidepressants like anxiety and, 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 and that kind of stuff was crashing my mood constantly, but yeah. I figured out a way to do it without it. And, I, and I'm just thrilled about it. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Well, that's inspiring. Really. It is a lot of people struggle with how to live day to day. Um, not realizing like you pointed out correctly that that's your whole life. Your life is literally just made up of days <laughs> one after the yeah. other, right? Yeah. That's all it is. So yeah, it's such a great point. Um, you know, I, I, I talked to my mother about this. My mother, since my father passed away like six years ago, she's had a tough time, like just sort of reacclimating to life and like what to do and how to be happy. And I've had several conversations with my brother. My brother has too about just, you know, controlling your own happiness. I know it sounds weird, but like, it's really just about decisions. I think sometimes mentally, you know, something comes up in your day and how you take that on is literally, it's, yeah. it's up here, right? You can decide, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take this experience this way, this way, this way, or this way. Right. And a lot of them are positive. A lot of them are negative. It's like pick the one I feel that's, you know, positive that you can, you know, make the most out of, um, you know, what, what another opportunity that can come from that. Um, but just like you said, if you just complain about everything, then that's, then that's your life. If, yeah. if all you do is complain about it, then of course your life is all, all the negative things around you because that's what you're pointing out to yourself all the time. So of course that's what your life's going to be like. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're, if you're constantly, you know, thinking about all the good things in your life and like you said, what you're grateful for, what you actually have and focused on that, then that's a much different experience of yeah. life. Right. So yeah, it's, it's such a crazy, it's such a crazy thing that there's so, we have so much more control than we you know, are, yes. are led to, are led to believe. Absolutely. And you know what, you know where it starts? It starts with thinking that things like happiness and satisfaction and love come from out there. Exactly. And they don't, you can't, you know, if you're looking for them out there, you won't find them. You'll occasionally find something that satisfies you occasionally find something that, that you, that makes you happy you'll occasionally find something that you love. But if you want that to last, you have to go inside. That This is where everything yeah. really comes from. You're, you're, yeah. you're satisfied with yourself. Yeah. And, and, and love, and the thing that I really, because um, I, I, I have a, a couple of failed marriages behind me, and the thing that I learned over time is that um, love isn't something that happens to you. It's a choice you make. Yeah. Love is a choice, not a feeling. Lust is a feeling, attraction is a feeling, but love is a choice. You choose to love somebody. Once you decide that they're within the ballpark <laughs> of what you're looking for, then you choose to love them and accept them for as they, uh, the way they are. And that, and if both partners are doing that, 
you've got it. You've got a good relationship. But if you fall crazy in love with somebody and you marry them and a few years later, you're just kind of bored with them and you move on. That's not that you were never really in love. Sure. You're just now, writing you can, out those feelings you had. Yeah. Sometimes you can be truly in love with somebody and they can abuse you so badly that you have to walk away. And that's fine. That sure. doesn't mean you never love that person. That just means that you're doing something better for yourself. Yeah. Um, we've all had situations like that where a partner, yeah. they just treat you so badly that you're like, okay, fine. Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out yeah. Here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But you gotta put yourself so, first, right? You can't, if you're not happy, one, if you're not happy, you can't be happy in a relationship. It's that simple. A relationship's not going to make you happy, right? Uh, it's just in life. I mean, it's it, it starts here. It's all the base. It's the foundation. It's here. Uh, I'm a big yeah. believer in eating right, but food is a big thing to control your body as well. You know, yeah. think about eating some, you know, some shitty stuff, and what does that do to your body and your mental state afterward? I mean, it's it's really there yeah. is a, a cause and effect there, pretty, you know, I impactful and immediate. Um, yeah. and, you know, and that stuff builds up over time too. So the, you know, it's kind of a great thing. It's like the better I eat, I'm just building on it. I'm, I'm better every day and mentally I'm going to be better in a better mood. And it just it has such a ripple effect, it puts other people in good mood. Then they're you know, right. Then that, then that's, um, more things can come out of it. I've also seen that more opportunities happen like that in life. If you have yeah. that attitude. Yeah, you know? when, you, when you're living in the flow, things start yeah. to crumble your direction. I, I'm a big believer in karma. I didn't used to be. In fact, I've made fun of karma for years. But <laughs> I'm now a big believer in karma. I think it's the way the world works. It's not a religious sure. thing. It's the way things work. Um, this is the here's, here's something that happened to me. We're almost out of time, so I have to tell you this. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I was working on my cartoon strip, and a scene from a story popped in my head. And I, I didn't... I wasn't thinking about it. I had no idea where it came from. I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. So I just jotted it down. And if a day or two later, the next scene came into my head. And I went, oh, shit. Yeah, then this. Then this. And I started writing it out. And I thought, damn, this is a story. Where's this coming from? Because I didn't have a story in my head. I had no <laughs> desire to write a story. Wow. It just started coming to me. It was the most amazing thing. Wow. I was in my, was in my uh, late 50s. This had, this had never happened to me before. Wow. I mean, I've always been an artist. I've had images come to me and I paint them or draw them or whatever. So I'm used to that. But here came this story. And um, anyway, awesome. so I started writing it down. And I thought, shit, this could be a graphic novel. And I thought, that seems like a lot of work. I don't really want to write a graphic novel. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of, it's a lot of work. That's like writing a book and then drawing a picture of every paragraph. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's exactly what a graphic novel is. It's, it's like storyboarding a movie that will probably never be filmed. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, oh, anyway, so I ignored it, but I kept, but it kept coming to me and I ignored it and it kept coming to me. So then eventually I just sat down and I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to write this story. So I wrote, 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 wrote. And every single day, it surprised me where it went. And at the end of the day, I'd go up to the roof with my wife for a cocktail and, and marijuana. <laughs> and, we, and I would say, I can't, you can't believe where the story went today. Let me tell you about it. You know, and I would tell her what scenes I wrote that day. Oh, and it was, it was just a, an amazing experience that I That's awesome. That I, and so I started and, and then I just thought, I, I, eventually I got to the end of it. And I like this thing went on and on and on. It's a very long story. And I, I don't know. I'm gonna, just going to write until it ends. And then eventually it ended itself. It found, it found its ending. And honestly, I, I typed this book, but I didn't write it. I made choices along the way, but the story was coming to me. And I wow. decided like, what would be the best way to do this or what, you know, but, uh, and then I realized this is the same thing that's been happening to certain pieces of art and paintings and cartoons. There are certain ones that I, that I make happen. And there are certain ones that happen. They come to me and it completely, because I was a die hard atheist when this happened to me, I thought there's nothing beyond this. I had, I'd been religious as a kid. I'd explored this, I'd explored that, but I really had come to this thing that, okay, so 
I'm some kind of a biological accident. And for some reason I can draw really good. And for some reason I have funny ideas. And sometimes I write stories, I guess, I don't know, but this <laughs> thing changed my mind. This is like, this came from somewhere Wow. with a purpose and an intent and a structure that I did not have in me. This did not wow. come from me and I'm convinced of it anyway. So I started illustrating it and posting it online for free purely for donations. Anybody can read it. The problem with it is a very long story and it's taken me a long time to illustrate it. So like every two weeks I'll post what ends up being about 45 seconds of conversation (laughs) 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 or being filmed, you know, it'd be like, it's, it's literally like trying to animate something, you know, it takes forever to draw. But anyway, it's called peyote cowboy. That's the name of the story. Peyote cowboy. And it's, there's a cowboy who happens to eat some peyote and some stuff happens. Um, Oh my God. Anyway, but it's, peyotecowboy.net, not .com. That's actually somebody who grows peyote or something. But peyotecowboy.net. I know, I couldn't get peyotecowboy.com, which is, breaks my heart. But anyway, peyotecowboy.net <laughs> is where you'll find it. And it's, uh, if you like the story and you want, but anyway, the, the, I've, I've, I've posted like 40 something episodes now, which is really only about like less than 10% of the story. I'm not wow. kidding. It's, so there's it's a still lot to go. Story. Yeah. Wow. There is, it'll take me probably five years to illustrate this book. And then after it's done, I'll, I will probably print it. I mean, if, if a publisher wants to print it, 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 either in a series or in one big book, fine. That's cool. And, and we'll try to sell it. I'll see if I make any money. But for now, it's completely just the gift economy. Like this story came to me as a gift. So I'm passing it on as a gift. And if oh. people are enjoying it, and some people are, then toss me some money through Patreon. At the bottom of my, every page, there's a link. You can see a little video of me explaining how I wrote it and why I, anyway, why it was important to me. Um, That's awesome. Anyway, I think it's, I, anyways, it's been, it's been really cool. And it's enabled me to use a lot of elaborate art that I can't really do so much in Bizarro because of the tiny sure. format. So I'm like going crazy with the art and, 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 and also the guy's on a, I mean, the guy is, per, I mean, perhaps he's on a peyote trip. You don't really, that's the cool thing about the story is you really don't know. Ooh, I like that. You don't know yeah. what's, you don't know what's happening, but this guy has clearly stepped into what seems to be a typical town in the old West, but things don't work there the way they do the way they should. And so he, anyway, like it's magical realism is basically the style of it. Have you anyway, done peyote in, in real life? Have you ever tried it? I did some peyote. I did some peyote once. I've experimented a little bit with psychedelics in, in sort of, well, I'll tell you when I was younger, I, I, I experimented not a lot. I'm not a huge drug taker, but I'm a big advocate of plant medicine and, and natural psychedelics. Got it. Yeah, um, me too. Me too. Yeah. And they could be super beneficial. They're not as dangerous as, as we were led 100%. to believe that. Hundred percent like government propaganda in the old days, yeah. yeah. And so um, I'm a big advocate of marijuana. Me uh, too. <laughs> daily use. It's God's gift to mankind. It's, I would it's, say every time you were talking about sitting on a roof smoking a joint, I thought, oh, how great would it be if I could go smoke a joint with you on a roof somewhere and talk about this shit? Are you kidding you're me? You're welcome to. And I grow my own, so it's my own. It's my own. Oh practice. man! It's I mean, you're in Mexico, awesome. man. Um, my family's from Mexico. My mom's from Mexico City. Um, I grew up I going. You know, what, what part of what part of Mexico are you in? I'm in San Miguel de Allende, which yeah, is San Miguel. down north of north of Mexico City, northwest of Mexico City, uh, by about four hours by car, and kind of right in the middle of the country. I'm six hours from the coast, so I don't live in. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, when a gringo moves to Mexico, they think you're in a beach town, and I'm not. I'm not in sure. some fancy beach town. This is a, this is an old Spanish colonial town in the in the mountains, and it's uh, really beautiful. It's a it's a very cool place to live, and I'm happy. We're very happy. Is it on the is it on the route from like let's say Laredo down to Mexico City? Is it on the bus route? Um, I, I would think not. I think no, no. They they would surpa- they would pass here, but not by far. They would probably pass east of here. I'm not sure what route okay. they would take. Interesting. I love Mexico City. We go down there every few months. Well, before the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's my, it's my favorite. Uh, definitely my favorite oh, city. I have such uh, such oh. great memories uh, growing up there for sure. Um, I used to live in Veracruz. Not well, probably like ten years ago. So east of you, I was uh, in Veracruz right. for a while, uh, about a year. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a great place. Yeah, there's it, a lot of great coastal towns. 
It's a great place. It was getting dangerous. Um, yeah, you know, I love my, I love my, you know, mm-hmm. I, I say my country. I mean, I'm not a citizen. My brother was born there, um, but I still, I mean, it's my, I feel like it's my country as well. Um, to be honest with you, I have so much family there. Um, sure. It's, it, you know, it just pains me, man. Like a lot of things that happened down there and yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough conversation. For you know, me. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, this might make you feel a little bit better. Um, Mexico's a, the, I mean, the government here is extremely corrupt. Um, all aspects of it. Sure. My, my uncle was a police officer in Mexico city for over 30 years. So yeah, I've but, heard, I've heard a lot of stories. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the police are corrupt. I mean, it's, it's not every cop, but it's, it, there's a lot of corruption here, but what's just, a, just about, <laughs> and there's, a, and there's a, a great deal of violence. It's one of the leading it's, <laughs> Mexico is one of the leading countries in the world in terms of homicides per capita. Sure. But here's the good news. It's not, it's, it's the overwhelming majority of that is drug cartel criminals killing drug cartel criminals for sure. territory. And, sure, sure. and, surprisingly few bystanders get killed in this uh, who are not actually family members of cartel members, you know, who are not in the fam- yeah. same family as cartels. And what you don't have here is random people going into schools, churches, movie theaters, and grocery stores and killing strangers. The epidemic that is happening in the United States d- doesn't happen almost anywhere else. Let's talk about that for a while. Well, let's not you and I talk about this, but <laughs> Um, why is that an epidemic peculiar to the United States? There are other places that are more violent in other ways, but I feel less, I feel less endangered here because I'm not a criminal and these yeah. guys aren't coming after me in the United States. You don't know if you're a target, you know, it's yeah. not that I feel dangerous in the United States either. I mean, I, I was born and raised there, grew up there. I was just there for two weeks with my family. And so I know statistically nobody's in a great deal of danger at any one given moment, but still, what is what is wrong with the U.S. that is causing people to crack in this specific way? I find it. I mean, I kind of think as the United States, there's far more weapons in the United States. There's more weapons than there are people. There are more yeah, handguns. There true. are more guns that's in the United true. States. Over three and a half. I mean, three hundred fifty million guns. Yeah, there's more guns true. in the United States than there are people. There aren't that many guns. Nowhere near that many guns in Mexico, and all of them came from the United States. Uh, but yeah. anyway, so well, well but they got knives that do other stuff. I mean, again, that's a different conversation because the violence is different down there. Like I remember being a teenager in Mexico city. I've been, I've been mugged. Okay. Lots of times I've never been mugged in the United States. Okay. So that it's a different level of violence. You're more likely to get pickpocketed. They're more likely to cut open your purse on the subway or the bus or the train. It's a different way of, it's just yeah. a different, um, it's just different. But like, I remember living in Veracruz and they'd have shootouts at the main touristy area where this shit never used to happen. Like when yeah. I was a kid, that was a safe area to go to Cancun, Acapulco, you know, yeah. uh, Puerto Vallarta, all of that. Ixtapa. None of that stuff was was bad. It just started to change. Yeah. The cartel started to basically branch out into yeah. uh, places they didn't used to go to. But here's what I'll say. Like the last thing I'll say about this, like, so I have a, uh, really very few family that has moved to America, actually, because a lot of people think, oh, the first chance any Mexican gets, they're coming to America. That's not true at all. OK, no. um, <laughs> like not at all. So most of my family, I, I mean, 99 percent does not want to come to America. I have zero desire to. Um, they love their life. They love their family. But they will readily admit, look, it is true. Something bad could happen at any given moment. Sure. That Right. That's that's different from what you would experience. You know, like my cousins worry about their kids getting kidnapped. Right. right? That's a that's a genuine concern for them in Mexico City and they take proper precautions for it. And it's just something that's that they snatch kids. It just it happens, you know, and and it's something to worry about. But when you're living day to day down there, you're having tacos, you're eating like you would here. You don't think about it. You think everything's fine. Everything's fine. until It's not fine. You know, that that's the thing in Mexico. That's that's really what it is. You know, you just got to be smart about it. But yeah, I love the country. I love the people. Of course, I love my people. Like, I love that place. I think it gets a bad rap here in the States for sure. Um, yeah. I'm glad, I, I love to hear that you're down there. I love to hear that, you know, you love the place. You, you, I mean, you're putting your money where your mouth is, you know, down oh. there. I, I love that, man. I I like I gained so much respect for you for real that they're like. 
the people, for real. Well, the other thing is like there's a there's a lot of wealthy gringos in this town, but sure. and, but we don't live we don't live among well, there are wealthy gringos in my neighborhood as well, but we live in a Mexican residential part of town, and most of, most of the people here uh, are blue collar workers. I mean, this yeah. is just, this is like the real Mexico. Yeah, and the, oh, that's the, people, awesome. the, the Mexicans that I know here, they are so hardworking and Absolutely. so honest, and they Absolutely. and they to the man to the person, I should say, to the person, they value family over money. They'd rather 100%. have family than a shit ton of money. And they yep. really are puzzled. Most of them are very puzzled by gringos who will live one or two people in a giant house with eight or 10 rooms. They can't sure. understand why would anybody want to live in a giant empty house when you could live in a house full of all of your relatives. And the Americans, of course, we Americans think the other way is like, oh, and all my relatives live with me <laughs> because we have a totally different uh, attitude toward it. But, um, you know, Americans are, as an American, I was constantly pissed off that I wasn't rich yet. Like, come on, I'm a cartoonist. A lot of people know my work. I'm a little bit famous sometimes, yeah. occasionally, depending on where I go. And my, <laughs> my, my work isn't over. Like, my every day, my ideas are in 350 newspapers. Why am I not a millionaire? But down here, I'm like, oh, my God, I am so grateful that I'm not a millionaire. Like, that was not my destiny. That would have ruined me. I'm glad wow. that I am who I am. I'm glad that I uh, – because money is like heroin. The more you have, the more you want. It's never enough. And it's I hate not, money. And, it, and eventually <laughs> it will kill you. It's not yeah. what you think it is. Like, you know, of course, nobody wants to be destitute. But once you've got enough, once you've got enough to get by. Yeah. What else do you need, right? Need. Yeah. You it's, know, not, so, I, it's not about that. It's not about the money for sure. I, you know, my whole life, that, that's what I've. You know, my friends, my family know that about me. I hate money. I don't care about money. The only thing I care about are experiences. But literally, that's it. I love experiences. I love people, connecting with people. That's what I look for in life. Like that's that's the that's my goal. That's you know that's what I go for. Good for you. Um, that, that, that I've always been that way. I just could care less about things, physical thing. I could care. Le- I mean, there's nothing I'm attached. Literally nothing. There's not one piece of nada. Um, and. You know, I I think about this all the time, like when my father passed away, that had a big impact on me. You know, it it reinforced it more, which was my dad, you know, on his deathbed, like we got the last two weeks with them. You know, we know he's going to pass away. He's sick. You know, it's it's something actually a lot of people don't get to do, to be honest with you. Um, And basically, you know, it came down to what was he talking about in his last moments of life? He wasn't thinking Oh my God, I wish I made more money. I wish I had more money in my bank account. I wish I would have done that. The only thing he really talked about and, and what I've come to learn a lot of people in their last moments is it, all the things they didn't get to do. You know, mm. that's it. That's what they really think about. I didn't go this, to this place. I didn't call this person and say, I'm sorry. I didn't, you yeah. know, whatever it may be. Take, I should have taken that job that I w- would have been for me. Even though maybe I made less money, I would have been happier. You know, it's you start running through all those moments and it wasn't the moments you regret doing. That was something I thought maybe, you know, people would have or at least my father might have. But it's nothing like that. Not regretting any decisions you made, just the things you didn't do. That stuck with me. That's really hit me hard. And and I've, you know, I've I've really taken that to another gear since that, for sure. I mean, I take any opportunity. I say, yes, I'm a let's go let's try i you know i don't want to look back like that and, and say feel yes like I to life out. yeah say yes to life and i go for the things that make me happy and do not how much money am i making you know that's just not how i live my life i'm, I'm not happy right. that way i can't be happy like you said if my day-to-day is i'm miserable how is that going to be fun for me even if i'm making a ton of money i i'm just that's not fun for me uh, yeah it's crazy I, it's, yeah it's, I, I spent a lot of years doing what so many people do is like, when this happens, then I'll be happy. When I get to this point, then I'll be happy. Yeah. And that point is always in the future. And it's always now. If you're not happy now, you're not ever going to be happy. Stop thinking that's going to happen. It's not. You better be happy now. Make yourself happy now, no matter what. And you'll always be happy. Bingo. It's that easy. (laughs) Although it's hard. (laughs) 
Dan, you're so awesome to talk to, man. I got to say, I've really, I've really enjoyed this conversation, man. If at any point uh, somehow you. we can smoke a joint on a roof somewhere, I will make that happen. Uh, hey, then, sure. If you decide to come down here and visit the family, let me know and you can stop by and we'll, and we'll, I'll set you up. That's what I'm talking about, man. All right. Wow, that sounds amazing. Listen, All Dan, right. yes, my best to you and your family. Uh, please you. take care. And uh, yeah, please enjoy the rest of the weekend. Again, super All enjoy right. this conversation. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, buddy. All right, brother. Be good. Bye. Bye-bye. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. Mm-hmm.